A very warm digital welcome to all of you, wherever you might be watching or following this, this live stream from. My name is Gwendolyn Sasse. I'm the director of the Center for East European and International Studies, SOIS, in Berlin. And it is my pleasure today to not only open the discussion for this evening's or this afternoon's event, but also to open a whole series of discussions dedicated to 30 post-Soviet years. 2021 is or marks the 30th anniversary of the end of the Soviet Union. In December 1991, the Soviet Union was officially dissolved. This was the end point of a long protracted process. And in cooperation with a number of institutional partners, we want to use this anniversary to uh, think back, to retrace steps, trajectories, to provoke, to take stock of challenges, and hopefully also to offer new unexpected perspectives on the 30 post-Soviet years. Our institutional partners are the Kerber Foundation, the German Association for East European Studies, the German Historical Institute in Moscow, the Friedrich Ebert Foundation in Russia, and Memorial. And we hope that um, this evening's discussion is, is a nice opening with uh, perhaps slightly different perspective on the end of the Soviet Union which not only changed things dramatically for the independent states emerging or re-emerging from the Soviet Union, but also for regional orders and for global politics. I want to also add that the title 30 post-Soviet years is not trying to lump together the post-Soviet countries into one post-Soviet space, but it is rather an invitation to discuss the 30 years since 1991 and to really think about similarities and differences in the different um, countries and in the region as a whole. After today's discussion on the end of alternatives, for which I will hand over to my colleague Sandra Dahlke in a moment, you have a number of other events already planned to look forward to. You can find them on our website and on the websites of our institutional partners. Today, we also have uploaded our first podcast, SOIS podcast, on remembering the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe. We will have a first SOIS forum on the 20th of April, for example, on the end of communism as a generational phenomenon at the German Historical Institute in Moscow. On the 22nd of April, there will be a panel discussion on a move from socialist property to a market economy or private property. And in May, we will follow with a number of discussions about regional security in the late Soviet and in the post-Soviet period, but also the Kerber History Forum in May will focus in a couple of breakout sessions on aspects of the 30 post-Soviet years with a focus on Belarus and the Caucasus. So I hope this has whet everybody's appetite, but without further ado, we want to move on to today's discussion and I hand over to Sandra to uh, moderate the discussion on the end alternatives, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the global south. Over to you, Zandra. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gwendolyn. I was, uh, it was a moment of shock for me because my computer collapsed, and, uh, but now I'm ill again. That's, uh, that's good. Dear colleagues, dear uh, participants, I welcome you at our today's Roundtable, the end of alternatives, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the global south. My name is Sandra Dalga. I'm the director of the German Historical Institute in Moscow. I'm very happy to have so prolific colleagues on the virtual podium. And it's my pleasure to chair our today's discussion. Let me say some introductory remarks before we start. The collapse of the Soviet Union had not only affected the domestic conditions of its successor states, it profoundly changed the political tectonics of the world as well as many regional orders. Especially in Germany, the end of the largest socialist state in the world is largely associated with unification of Germany, the dissolution of the Eastern Bloc, the victory of the capitalist economic model, and the integration of East and Central European members of the obsolete Warsaw Pact and the Comic Con into NATO and the European Union. In contrast, 
the significance of the collapse of the Soviet Union for states, institutions, and individual actors of the global South has been largely ignored in our public discourse. Our today's roundtable aims at widening our conventional perspective. Together with leading experts in the field of global studies, we will explore the short and long-term effects of the Soviet collapse on politics, social and economic systems, and individual life in the global South. Now, I would like to introduce our speakers in the order of their respective contributions. The first speaker is Steffi Marung, who will give a short keynote speech. Steffi is a senior researcher at the Global and European Studies Institute of Leipzig University and the director of its global studies program, as well as principal investigator of a research project entitled Free Radicals, Political Mobilities and Post-Colonial Processes of Free Specialization in the Second Half of the 20th Century at Leipzig University. Specializing on global connections of Eastern Europe in the 19th and 20th centuries, Steffi teaches global history at Leipzig and Addis Abeba universities. Currently, her research addresses more broadly socialist mobilities of activists and experts, topic uh, uh, about which she will, she will talk today, from Eastern Europe and the global South during the 20th century as well as debates on international development with a focus on the agrarian question. At the moment, she works on a book project investigating Soviet African studies during the Cold War. Our second speaker is, uh, speaker is Artemy Kalinowski. Artemy is a professor at Temple University's College of Liberal Arts in Amsterdam and affiliated with the Amsterdam School of Regional, Transnational and European Studies. He's currently working on a project titled Building a Better Tomorrow, Development, Knowledge and Practice in Central Asia and Beyond between 1917 and, 20, uh, tw uh, 70 and tw uh, 2017. The project studies the legacies of socialist development in contemporary Central Asia to examine entanglements between socialist and capitalist development approaches in the late 20th century. Artemi published his first book in 2011 about the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan. His most recent book entitled Le a laboratory of socialist development, Cold War politics and decolonization in Soviet Tajikistan places the development of Central Asia in the post-Soviet era in the global context. Steffi and Artemi most recently published together with James Mark, the book Alternative Globalizations Encounters Between the Eastern Bloc and the Postcolonial World, uh, which was published, I think, last year with Indiana University Press. Our last uh, speaker will be Manuela Boatka. I, I hope that I pronounce your name uh, in the correct way. Manuela is a professor of sociology and head of school of the global studies program at Albert Ludwigs uh, University in Freiburg. Her area of expertise covers social theory, world system analysis, sociology of development, political sociology, social inequality, Eastern Europe and Latin America, post-colonial studies, gender and violence. Together with Anka Pavulescu, she is currently preparing a book entitled Creolizing the Modern Transylvania Across Empires that will be published next uh, year with Cornell University Press. From her impressive list of publications, I will just uh, mention her latest two books. The most recent one is entitled Lab uh, Labor Laboratories of Modernity, 
Eastern Europe and Latin America in correlation. This is a collection of English language articles translated into Romanian. That's not only in English, but also uh, in other languages that we would try to, uh, to convey our knowledge um, to a broader public. That's, that is good. Uh, the title of another book uh, that was first published in 2015, uh, Global Inequalities Beyond Occidentalism, leads us to the change of perspectives we would like to embark on in our today's discussion. Before we start, uh, I would like to make some technical remarks. Uh, during our roundtable, you have the possibility to ask questions or to make comments in German, English or Russian by using uh, the chat. And I will do my very best uh, to take your questions and to pass them on to the speakers, but I think the speakers will follow uh, the chat uh, also. Um, Steffi, please, uh, now the floor is for you. Thanks a lot uh, for these uh, kind two introductions and um, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, wonderful series um, and also um, to have this uh, different geography included in, in these discussions. Uh, and I'm looking very much forward to the roundtable, but also to the comments um, in the chat and our discussion. Uh, I will share my screen now. <clears throat> and hope to, to keep more or less in time. Um, so preparing this uh, presentation has been quite a challenge, um, I have to admit, but I was uh, actually glad to, um, to be forced to think about uh, the effects uh, of the collapse. It has been a challenge because I've been actually doing my work, uh, as Sandra explained, uh, rather on the period whose ending is here being discussed. Um, I've been more uh, trying uh, to understand how Soviet experts and elites try to make sense of a decolonizing African continent in the context of the Cold War and how these observations, but also their travels and their encounters with African colleagues and partners has shaped their understanding of what socialism is about, what the Soviet Union is about, what development is about. And in the course of my work, I became also increasingly interested in the perspectives of African, but also African-American actors, intellectuals, activists on the Soviet Union and how they tried to interpret this um, model, the Soviet model of development, Soviet model of socialism uh, to make sense and to articulate their own visions uh, of a changing world order and to develop uh, an argument about uh, black radical um, contributions to this changing world order. So therefore, I'm, I both am and I'm not uh, really an expert to talk uh, about the effects of the collapse of the Soviet Union on the Global South here, because I've been doing most of my work on previous periods, uh, but also, um, on the other hand, I've been trying to understand how actors from the Global South um, try to make sense of this model and how this has impacted their trajectories more, more broadly. But I can also frankly admit that it's actually the the effect of the collapse or rather how quick it, uh, this Soviet model, model withered away or seemingly withered away, uh, how quick this happened uh, and this an astonishment um, about this quick disappearance uh, actually drives a lot of my work on the past to understand um, more about these legacies uh, and how it quickly withered away in Cold War triumphalism but also in the multiple traumas of the 1990s in many world regions, uh, but also in seemingly brand new dynamics that are often given misleading names such as globalization, uh, as if it has started only after the Cold War, or the war against terror, or the so-called refugee crisis, or the financial crisis, and now the pandemic. Following and browsing the more popular presentations of the collapse of the Soviet Union and with it the delegitimization of its social, economic and political model and its effects for the societies in the global south, one comes across some major tropes and narratives. Um, narratives of collapse, of failure, of evaporation on the one hand, while the disappearance of the Soviet Union is on the other hand often presented as a removal of obstacles for developments in the global south 
uh, for example, paving the way for the end of apartheid in South Africa with its effect on neighboring Namibia, Angola and Mozambique, but also giving way to what has been conceptualized as a so-called third wave of democratization in Benin, Ethiopia, Congo or Tanzania. The evaluation of the effects of the collapse, however, vary across the post-Cold War decades. While during the 1990s, the triumph of Western capitalism was celebrated and the tumbling down of socialist oriented political regimes across Africa and Asia accordingly connected, the public opinion in the West noted in the 2000s the demise of Russia as a global power on the one hand and the parallel rise of new socialist regimes in particular in Latin America with Chavez in Venezuela, Kirchner in Argentina or Morales in Bolivia. During the second decade of the 21st century, the West became increasingly obsessed with the so-called return of Russian ambitions to play a prominent role in non-European regions of the world, currently as a producer of desperately sought for vaccines in the fight against the pandemic, forging new alliances with partners in Brazil, in Egypt or in India, but more generally also observing, for example, the Russian-Syrian alliance or Russia's revived Africa strategy. Hence, more widespread narratives on the effects of the collapse of the Soviet Union for the global south revolve often around geopolitical themes and address, for example, the withering away of development aid, the collapse of financial and economic ties, the cut off of military support and the flooding of many countries in the global south with discharged Soviet weapons, fueling the violent conflicts of the ensuing decades. Similar to the connections made between the Soviet collapse and the tumbling down of Marxist oriented regimes, for example, in Africa, these narratives more generally perpetuate a Cold War lens. The defeat on one side of the, glo of the global equation imagined in bipolar ways counts as a victory for the other. But the shortcut made between the fall of socialism and the rise of capitalism has obscured many uh, of the more complex variations of alternative visions of world order and social, political and economic development that have existed before and which are now again marginalized. More broadly, I'd argue, the simplifying lens is unable to grasp the complicated connections between and legacies of colonial, post-colonial and post-socialist visions and trajectories. It is against this big background also interesting to see how in the present, the revitalization of, uh, for example, Russian African relations, mobilized narratives and tropes from a shared past. In the declaration of the first Russia Africa summit uh, in 2019 in Sochi, the joint struggle for decolonization marks the common starting point while the perception of the envisioned new world order both draws on newly articulated critiques of a Western dominated global order, as well as it emphasizes industrial modernity in a multipolar world. As a historian, I would against this background invite for investigating the complexities and less visible trajectories of Soviet Southern encounters of the past in order to be able to grasp how the legacies of the collapse of the Soviet model impacts our present. In this regard, the last decades have seen a tremendously productive research field, um, and I'm humbly grateful here to be, uh, be um, uh, partnered by two colleagues who have made outstanding contributions to this field and are joined by many others, often from a younger generation. I've picked here just a few of these examples. The slide was uh, already quite packed. We have, for example, uh, investigated educational, political, economic mobilities of intellectuals and activists, of experts and engineers, phys physicians, artists who study in the Soviet Union and in the socialist bloc, but whose careers and formation could not be reduced to the imitation and then falling apart of the Soviet model. From there, we can pose questions about the effects of such biographical trajectories for the political economies of post-colonial states and how these individual actors had to reimagine their biographies and understanding of post-colonial futures after the collapse of the former host country. I'd argue that in many of these cases, the Soviet Union was less a model to be followed than it was an arena and a provider of resources and infrastructures, as well it was an inspiration or lens through which actors from the global south came to articulate their post-colonial positions. Hence, if the connections and encounters were more complex than what a conventional Atlanto-centric Cold War narrative would suggest, we will also need more differentiated uh, answers to the question of what was the effect of the collapse going beyond topoi of breakdown and crisis. The broader points I would like to raise here and bring to the discussion um, are the following. 
Uh, firstly, I think we are still struggling to understand the more complex relations between the Soviet model and the global south. And we are still only at the beginning to move beyond Cold War mental maps and geographies of circulation, cooperation and competition. There is more historical research to be done, which also requires a more intensive cooperation between specialists on Russian and Soviet histories on the one hand and on Asian, African and Latin American histories on the other. This cooperation has its own intricacies, as the ending of the Cold War more broadly has not only created trauma in societies in the former socialist camp, but in many academic communities across the global south, which need to be addressed before communication becomes possible. Secondly, the findings of this historical work, as an historian, I have to argue that, will need us, uh, will help us to better discern the complexities of our present by going beyond an interpretation of the present, which is still organized along a Manichaean worldview stemming from the Cold War period. In this way, we can then start thinking and researching about the relations between the posts more broadly, how socialism and post-socialism is related to colonialism and post-colonialism. We can start discussing the multiplicity of projects and imaginations of people to make sense of, find a position in, and organize a globally entangled world going beyond capitalist triumphalism, but also beyond presentist critiques of neoliberalism, as well as beyond xenophobic populism. We will in this way, I think, be better able to grasp both the globalized present as well as global policy projects of Russia, but also the trajectories of societies in the global south. So before getting into how its collapse affected the global south, we would first of all need to disentangle the Soviet model itself. This meant many different things and became relevant in different ways for actors in the global south. Some would highlight the Leninist nationality policy, others a certain type of state and party as a model for post-colonial governance. Again, others visions of industrial modernity to be reconciled with the rural past or ideas about mass education, literacy campaigns and culture complemented by questions regarding the emancipation of women or of anti-racism and more broadly, the fascination with how a mostly agrarian society, both its former imperial core and its previous colonial periphery could accomplish a great leap forward into socialist modernity and escape tentatively the dominance of a capitalist global economic system. The attraction of this model was certainly also connected to how it could, be, could provide economic, military, educational and political assistance and with which conditions. Thus, while it's the post-Soviet era which this roundtable addresses, aiming at the effects and legacies of the collapse, I feel more confident as an historian to draw attention to the complexities of the past from where I would argue it becomes possible to interrogate the present. Let me therefore turn to three exemplary personalities and their considerations of the Soviet model in order to illustrate the intricate trajectories and connections I'd, I'd suggest to investigate to better understand the posts. When the influential Harlem Renaissance poet Langston Hughes traveled in 1932-1933 across the Soviet Union, he wrote with his A Negro Looks at Soviet Central Asia, uh, published in 1934, a travel account which Artemi knows, uh, of course, also very well, in which he systematically compared his perception of the US American with the Soviet South, organizing this comparison around key themes such as racism and its connection to a global capitalist order, peasant and women education and em emancipation, religion and secularization, folk and national culture. I quote, you can imagine the contrast. I was starting out from Moscow, capital of the new world, bound for Central Asia to discover how the people live and work there. I wanted to compare their existence with that of the college and oppressed peoples I had known on a capitalism in Cuba, Haiti, Mexico, and my own United States. I wanted to study the life of these people in the Soviet Union and write a book about them for the dark races of the capitalist world. Having grown up in the US, Hughes had spent a year with his father in Mexico before he went in the 1920s to the UK, where he joined the black community. Back in the US, he studied at Lincoln University and extensively traveled the Caribbean. His trip to the Soviet Union was originally devoted to a film project, uh, which never materialized, but Hughes seized the opportunity to leave Moscow and Leningrad towards Central Asia and further to Japan, China, and Korea. Never a member of the Communist Party, his enthusiasm for the Soviet Union clearly cooled down in the 1940s. Still, his presentation of the Soviet South are inspiring as they are situated in a more complex itinerary that went beyond a US-Soviet axis 
but encompassed the Caribbean and Latin America as well as Eastern Asia. It further connected reflections on black modernity with Soviet efforts to transform Central Asia from a former colonial periphery into a socialist space, a project in which also black specialists participated. He writes, at evening, we came to the big city of Tashkent, the center of the Soviet East. There we were met by a large workers' delegation, including brown, faint-skinned Russian, and an American Negro engineer from Harvard University, now helping to build roads across Asia. His Soviet experience inspired him also to consider how to globalize the outlook for future black generations in the US. Children under the new life, while well, there's no comparing them with children in Europe or America, in Uzbekistan, many youngsters seemed to know world politics better than I did. They could ask me questions I did not know to, how to answer. And at their pioneer meetings, they stand on their strong little legs, independent and confident, and give intelligent opinions on subjects as big as war and world revolution, things a New York child has not even heard of before adolescence. The particular international spirit of the 1930s, before the Stalinist ruptures of these broader global connections, was shared by many of Hughes' fellow travelers, who shaped with their intellectual and physical mobilities a Black At Atlantic that extended far to the East and included Soviet American connections to modernize Asia. The Soviet model was part of a larger universe and certainly a crucial, yet not the undisputed and not the only point of reference for Black international radicalism of the period. 30 years after Hughes, the Caribbean scholar and activist Walter Rodney arrived in Moscow. When I traveled to the Soviet Union, I was struck on arrival at the airport by the physical demeanor and the social aspects of the people at the airport. They were workers and peasants, as far as I could see, who were flying on those TU-104s to Moscow, to Leningrad, etc., as though they were using a bus. And my understanding of an airport was that it was a very bourgeois institution. There were only certain of us who were supposed to be in the airport. But the Soviets seemed to have ascended beyond that. Born in British Guyana, Rodney went in 1960 for three years to study at the University of West Indies at Mona in Jamaica, from where he went on a tour across the Soviet Union. He relocated from there to London, where he obtained his doctorate at SOAS, and it was in post-imperial London where he not only got involved in still active Marxist circles of the city, it were Rodney's years at the University College of Dar es Salaam with interruptions between 66 and 72, which was probably the academically and intellectually most productive period in his life, in which some of his most renowned books and articles were written or conceived. His How Europe Underdeveloped Africa belongs until today to the most influential contributions of black intellectuals to analyze and criticize colonial and post-colonial trajectories. In Dar, as a hub of decolonization, Rodney also prepared lectures he held in 1970-71 on the Russian Revolution, which were published in 2018 for the first time in book format by RDT Kelly as the Russian Revolution, a view from the third world. Less prominent than how Europe underdeveloped Africa, but particularly illuminating with regard to the intertwinement of post-colonial transformations in Eastern Europe and Africa, Rodney's Russian Revolution revealed the unique contribution of black intellectuals to globalize socialism. While in How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, the Soviet Union appeared as a model for postcolonial African states, his work on the Russian Revolution differs in its approach. Rodney works here through the Russian Revolution in order to raise the awareness of his students to make their own sense of the dynamics in Africa. Russia and the Soviet Union became here on the one hand a looking glass through which also to discern the dangers and degenerations of anti-colonial revolutions. It was less a call for understanding the model character of the Russian revolution, but to develop a sincere African position vis-a-vis -vis world history by teaching it from an African perspective to African students. He used his course on the Russian revolution, which is otherwise very much focused on Russian and Soviet domestic dynamics, to make African subjects in the writing of global history via comparison. Rodney thus not only situated the Russian Revolution in a broader global context, comparing it to African, Cuban, and Chinese trajectories, but by distancing himself both from Western and from Soviet accounts of the revolution. Still, he writes, um, understanding the Soviet Union is a priority that is self-evident as it was the first decisive breakaway from international capitalism, affecting thereby the subsequent course of events around the world, including Africa. Starting from this basic assumption, Rodney embarks on an analysis of the Russian revolution in its own right to make his students come to conclusion themselves in how far they would understand it as a model for Africa. 
While Rodney systematically compares the Russian Revolution to dynamics in Asia, the Caribbean, and Africa, he does not outrightly present it as a model, rather as a lens through which to understand the African present. One of his major themes in this regard was the agrarian question. His chapter on building a socialist state hence starts with the claim that, I quote, one of the most crucial tasks facing the Soviet regime was how to make the agrarian sector socialist, quote end. And while he did not ignore the atrocities committed in the context of forced collectivization in the years under Stalin, which he also based on Soviet contemporary accounts of this period, he used the African lens to invite for alternative interpretations. I quote, we who have suffered from the same exploitation and oppression ought to be able to take a more understanding view of why the poor peasants wreaked personal vengeance in the, on the kulaks and other well-to-do peasants. We can take a more compassionate view without necessarily saying that Stalin's policy was right or that the Bolshevik government should be free from blame. Two more decades fast forward, the South African longtime leader in the South African Communist Party, Joe Slovo, asked in his 1989 uh, paper, Has Socialism Failed? And he emphasized, for our part, we firmly believe in the future uh, and future socialism. And we do not dismiss its whole past as an unmitigated failure. Socialism certainly produced a Stalin and a Ceausescu, but it also produced a Lenin and a Gorbachev. Despite the distortion at the top, the nobility of socialism's basis, uh, basic objectives inspired millions upon millions to, to, to devote themselves selflessly to building it on the ground. And no one can doubt that if humanity is today poised to enter an unprecedented era of peace and civilized international relations, it is in the first place due, due to the efforts of the socialist world. Born in 1926 in Lithuania into a Jewish family, they emigrated in 1934 to South Africa. Slovo became a student activist at Wits University in Johannesburg in the 1950s and married Ruth First, another renowned anti-apartheid activist during these decades, her family being Jewish emigrant from Latvia. Slovo and First went in the early 1960s to Angola, Mozambique, the UK and Zambia into exile. While First was assassinated in 1982 in Mozambique, Slovo became minister in Mandela's first government after the 1994 elections. While the collapse of the Soviet Union posed a profound challenge to South African communists, it was for Slovo not the end of, his, of the story, as it had never been a Soviet story alone. Rather, he presented the end of the Cold War as a moment for reflection on the relation between capitalism and racism, as the dissolution of the socialist camp was for him not the equivalent with the failure of socialism as an alternative imaginary for a capitalist world order. As for Hughes and Rodney, Slovo's intellectual and political trajectory connected physical and imagined mobilities across Southern Africa, the UK and the Soviet Union, with the latter being a case to reflect about from an explicit South African communist perspective. I conclude. So where can we go from there? What could be initial observations and questions to further address and research on the legacies of the collapse on the evaporation of the Soviet model? One avenue we could follow in our research and conversations are the interruptions and reorientations of political, intellectual, economic and educational mobilities, which used to be promoted in a socialist world order, while its ending demobilized considerable groups of people. The end of the Soviet Union meant the closing of global connections towards the East, for example, for students and contract workers from the global South in the Soviet Union. And we still know little about the legacies of these mobilities and networks and how they are remobilized and reutilized. A second line of the discussion could be to revisit what has been enthusiastically celebrated in the 1990s as the return to Europe of the former socialist states. Often equated with the enlargement of the European Union, this European integration meant effectively the re-Eurocentrization of Eastern Europe, the cutting of its global ties, which seem to become revived at the moment, although in interesting ways, if you look at Hungary or Slovakia, for example. We should further interrogate if and how there has been a similar kind of new parochialism in the global south and to which effects. A third proposal I'd make is to address concepts of solidarity and internationalism and how they are remobilized for transnational movements today by a younger generation born after the end of the Cold War. Here we might observe another way of connecting questions of anti-racism, anti-colonialism and anti-capitalism that go beyond the Soviet model, but revitalize past experiences of engaging with it. Thank you. 
Steffi, thank you, thank you very much. I will uh, immediately ask uh, Atimi to, to react to, to, to Steffi's talk. Atimi, please. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> and I wanna thank the center uh, for putting this together and, and Steffi for such a stimulating opening. And uh, since we recently co-edited a book uh, related to what we're discussing today, it's not surprising that I think we agree on quite a lot. Um, and as Steffi, as Steffi has pointed out, there's been a lot of interesting work in, in recent years unpacking the nature of Soviet encounters with the post-colonial world and the results of this research defy easy characterization. On the one hand, we see that the Soviet Union did uh, serve as an ideal for some, for many, uh, and as a sort of arena for many others. Um, but we also know that Soviet officials' blindness on race, its general suspicion of foreigners, made sojourns in the USSR, USSR uncomfortable at best. Uh, undermining the message of solidarity that the Soviet Union wanted to project. And we also get a complex picture of how Soviet citizens themselves engaged with Soviet uh, anti-colonialism. Um, we know on the one hand, um, in part through the works that were on the slide that uh, Steffi showed that by the 1960s, at least, there was a certain sense of frustration on the part of some citizens that the USSR was spending money abroad instead of, instead of fulfilling commitments at home. Um, there was popular racism and xenophobia that Soviet authorities proved unable to control, but there was also genuine engagement with the Soviet anti-colonial project. And domestically, of course, that kind of anti-colonial project was organized around a somewhat contradictory uh, arrangement, right, the kind of process of national delimitation, right, the creating of or supporting of nationalisms that it thought would eventually wither away on the path to internationalism. Now in the region of the Soviet Union that I study, one of the themes that comes up uh, often in oral history as well as in memoirs is the importance of the anti-colonial struggle for students who were in school and university, especially during the 1960s. Um, as, uh, they were encouraged to think of themselves as formerly colonized peoples, uh, but now is the vanguard of socialist anti-colonialism, uh, and they took this call quite seriously. Many went to work as experts, engineers, cultural representatives, and diplomats. Not all came back convinced that they really had something to teach the post-colonial world, and some indeed came to see themselves as a result of these encounters very much as colonial subjects themselves, or at least they came to see that the USSR had much more in common with the empires it criticized than they had believed. Like Steffi, I'm a historian, and I'm more comfortable starting in the past and looking forward than I am starting in the present and using the past to explain it. But there are some issues where a presentist approach to historical inquiry um, can be particularly useful and certainly uh, is called for. And we usually come to two questions there. One is, how did we get here? And the other is, was another world possible? Um, and I think Steffi's presentation was particularly focused on that second question, right? Kind of showing us these. Uh, through the lives of these three individuals, um, the kind of worlds that were envisioned in part thanks to the mediating role that the Soviet Union played, not because the Soviet Union was directly a model to emulate, but because its presence opened up all sorts of others' possibility. I want to address the first question a bit, uh, or at least sketch out maybe how we might do so. And I want to do this by picking up on the themes that were raised about mobility, uh, the themes of mobility and entanglements that have already been raised. Uh, Russia today is no less engaged with the world than the USSR in some ways. Uh, Steffi has shown that as well. And it's arguably a larger destination for migration than the USSR ever was, or rather it remains, remains a destination for students from around the world. Uh, and uh, of course, labor migrants from former Soviet republics, particularly those of Central Asia. Um, and yet we know that many of those who come to Russia today face violence, harassment by authorities, and other problems on a much worse scale than during the Soviet period. So as a historian, I want to know, is this a post-Soviet phenomenon? To what extent is it a post-Soviet phenomenon? Does it have roots in the Soviet period? Period. What are the continuities and discontinuities between how the Soviet Union approached migration, inclusion, solidarity, how it managed populations and forced its ideals, and how these issues play out in Russia today? It's obviously a very large set of questions. Um, if we look at the relationship of Russia to, to the Central Asian republics today, it would seem to me 
uh, to be the opposite of the relationship during the latter Soviet era. Then, then there was low mobility and central planners wanted to encourage more. At the same time, there was a sense that while these republics seemed to lag the rest of the USSR and all sorts of indicators, they were moving in the same direction, both sort of meta-historically, but also in more concrete, let's say, development terms, and were certainly better off than most states emerging from colonialism. Now, in the late Soviet period, this starts to change. And I've already mentioned that some Central Asians themselves began to doubt the official narrative um, but if we look at discussions in Moscow in the late 1980s, we see a fairly rapid and profound shift as well. In particular, you start seeing economists uh, and other specialists who've been writing about the Middle East, Southeast Asia, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, suddenly start turning their attention to Central Asia. These are people who'd never written about the region before. Um, and without going into much detail, I think it's worth noting several things about these publications. Uh, first, these authors argued that the problems facing the region, low standards of living, low productivity, uh, environmental degradation, et cetera, et cetera, were actually quite similar in many ways to the problems facing those countries that have been subject to imperialism and capitalist exploitation. And second, in some of these writings, at least, the solution out of the problem was similarly to be found in the newly emerging consensus on what these countries needed, encouragement of small business, entrepreneurship, and so on. In other words, in their critique of Soviet development abroad at home, these specialists were drawing on the emerging consensus of the 1980s, what became known as the Washington Consensus, though of course they were not adopting it wholesale. Simultaneously, however, they were reimagining the Soviet Union even before its collapse was imminent, as firmly divided between a developed North and a backward South. As one article in 1991 put it, the USSR was a scale model of a contemporary world with a developed European part and a South that was much poorer and was bound to serve as a uh, source of mass migration, right? And some of these articles kind of, the authors are nervously eyeing what they believe to be the problems migration was causing in Western Europe and the United States. My point here is not that some Moscow-based social scientists single-handedly changed how Russians and Central Asians saw each other, much less that they were responsible for the collapse of the USSR or the way that the Central Asians, the way that Central Asians in Russia are treated today. Rather, the works I refer to reflect a larger paradigm shift uh, in the discourse, one created perhaps inadvertently by actors in different fields across the USSR, but whose appearance is inseparable from the very arenas and infrastructures described by Steffi in her presentation, at least as I understand them. This observation, however, leads to another problem. Why did this critique of Soviet development, uh, this deconstruction of Soviet claims about equality not lead then to greater solidarity? I should note that many of the scholars uh, I'm referring to the Russian scholars were arguing for this, right? Even as they were taking things from the Washington consensus, they were also saying that um, the more developed parts of the Soviet Union need to commit to more economic aid and, and raising standards of living and so forth. But of course, that's not what happened. Now, the answer to that question is obviously multifaceted and cannot be answered easily or with reference to one specific cause. And I think, of course, the trauma of the 1990s that Steph referred to is, is going to be a part of that answer. Um, another hypothesis, hypothesis I would like to put out there is the deconstruction of Soviet claims led to a cynicism about solidaristic claims more generally. The myth of Soviet internationalism was a productive one, and its dethronement had effects which many uh, of the critics writing in the 1980s could not foresee or did not foresee. It is useful perhaps again to return to Langston Hughes and his reflections on Central Asia written two decades after his sojourn in Central Asia at a time when many fellow travelers had turned against the USSR. And I Wander as I Wander, which I think was published in 1956, if I'm not mistaken, he makes clear that the contradictions of the Soviet Union's project in the region had been clear to him during the visit, but that his decision to look past them was a deliberate one. The promise of the USSR was worth looking past its fault. This was a trade-off that many had to make in that particular context when the Soviet Union seemed to represent one of the few viable alternatives uh, to both imperialism and uh, US kind of hegemony. And I think the Walter Rodney quote 
um, illustrates this as well. Um, the, and I'll conclude with this. Um, what we ultimately see, I think, in place of Soviet internationalism is not something completely new, of course, it's something that also has Soviet roots. Because with the collapse of Soviet universalism and Soviet internationalism is a part of that, um, we get a return to particularism, but one that is actually nurtured within the Soviet Union itself, right? And that is nationalism, right? And it's something that's nurtured sometimes on purpose, sometimes inadvertently, as part of kind of the Soviet attempt to reconcile this kind of imperial formation um, with its ideals. That's a mess of things, I think, to think about, but those are ones that we have to, we have to trace how they worked themselves out in the perestroika period in the early 1990s to make sense of what's happened um, in the three decades since. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Atemi, for, uh, for your input. And uh, as we uh, just had two historians, I would like to ask Manuela as a professor of sociology to add her uh, perspective uh, to, uh, to the question raised by, questions raised by Steffi and Atemi. Manuela, please. Yes, thank you so much, um, first of all, for the invitation and for organizing this, and to my colleagues for Jeffy for a wonderful presentation and Artemi for um, the comments and, and reactions. I think um, there are a lot of commonalities, so there won't be a, a debate in the sense of uh, a, a disagreement here, but uh, maybe in terms of um, bringing in a sociological or a more sociological perspective, um, it would be constructive in the sense that I actually do historical sociology myself, but for historians, historical sociologists are just imposter um, historians and for so not for the present uh, <laughs> historians, of course, and for sociologists, they're, they're too historical. So why don't they come to the present at some point? Um, and I think one of the best examples is um, what uh, Shafi mentioned in the very beginning about the misleading names starting with globalization. Um, and this is actually what is supposed to be the core of my professorship in five. It's actually called in jargon's uh, professorship for globalization. I said, well, I'm actually professorship, <laughs> a sociology then of a globalization that is older than that. And I think that the title that you chose for um, the event also is a play on some of these um, misleading terms because the end of alternatives obviously is uh, sending us back to the idea of the end of history that was very much um, discussed precisely 30 years ago. And I guess the focus on the global south that you rightly bring in and that you propose and that we've seen in the two previous contributions um, does in the first move um, accomplish a, sh a shift of perspective from these misleading understandings of globalization as new of uh, 1990 and 91 as the end of history or the end of alternatives. So you rightly pointed to the question mark on it. And the first thing that um, it does maybe looking to these um, concepts, maybe from a global South perspective um, is to even challenge our main terms, such as the Cold War. Because um, um, somebody like um, Argentinian philosopher Enrique Dulce um, said the Cold War was never cold for those who suffered it um, in the periphery. Uh, it is actually a hot war for us. But that doesn't come through as a perspective, neither um, in policy nor in language. What does that say about uh, positionality? And what does that say about um, what the end um, or whatever was it that was ending in 1991. I think there, um, my own perspectives is related to global systems analysis and decoloniality. Um, that's where both Dussel and, and Wallerstein, of course, come in. And from a perspective that was very much countering the idea of the end of alternatives or the end of history, um, world systems analysis was saying, Actually, um, the state socialism, because it wasn't um, socialism to court, it was state socialism in the Eastern European 
semi-periphery was very much supporting the capitalist world system. It was not the opponent. It was not the bipolar world order, but basically the um, socialism as a state policy was a political structure used by semi-peripheral notions, uh, nations, in order to stem a decline, to hinder a decline into the periphery. So basically um, the stage of um, basically the consolidation of it, the industrial capitalist world economy, as um, Wallerstein calls it, um, starts with the Russian Revolution, 1917, and basically state socialist regimes are classic mercantilist techniques to semi-withdraw from the world economy and thus cling on to a better status, which is not a core status, but it's not a peripheral status. So basically, it was much more likely for such a path to be chosen by Russia, China, and Cuba than by Thailand, Liberia, or Paraguay, where manufacturing beginnings and um, the personnel necessary for a mercantilist strategy was, was not there. So basically, what I'm trying to get uh, with um, by saying this is that such a strategy, not only economic, but also a political one, was contributing to depolarize the capitalist system. Um, so instead of just having a rich core and a impoverished exploited periphery that would definitely end up rising up against um, core dominance, the existence of the semi-periphery um, throughout the world economy, but especially in its state socialist variant was actually a, a possibility to provide a middle strata, both the agent of and the subject uh, to exploitation, but also one that buffers the um, polarization of, um, of the world system. So there is no um, kind of rising up of the South against the North, at least not immediately, and despite um, such very important processes and phenomena as the non-aligned movement, which were also part of both. But basically, the role of the state um, socialist regimes as a kind of mediator is, I think, something that we could productively focus on when we think about the collapse of um, Eastern European state socialism, because it was not a heralding of the triumph of liberalism, but was actually underscoring the lack of legitimacy of both liberalism and, and Marxism as ideological underpinnings, so to say, of, of capitalism. So maybe just focusing a bit on the way um, politics in the state socialist um, semi-periphery also had to do with processes of, of racialization that um, Artemy also mentioned that I think are crucial to understand because the semi-periphery was not just um, the neutral mediator and was not, of course, the internationalist um, glue uh, between uh, the core and the periphery. It very much would have liked to, but um, as we've already heard, there were very much both hierarchies and racialization processes taking place there. So if the onset of the Cold War, which wasn't cold, coincided with the decolonization in Africa and Asia, and with anti-imperialist mobilization across the, the Arab world, this is the influx of students, practitioners, labor migrants that's already been mentioned by, by uh, both my colleagues from the decolonized um, peripheries into Eastern Europe. Now that happens in the name of state um, socialist internationalism and solidarity, but um, the hundreds of thousands of Africans, Arabs, Asians, Latin Americans, um, that studied and worked in Eastern Europe and, and Soviet Union in particular, um, also had a crucial role in addressing race and racialization in Eastern Europe, bringing this up at all as, as a topic. And a lot of people have worked on it. Um, Zhivka Valavicharska has recently argued that was in particular African students who um, inspired anti-racist protests and, and resistance and that they were openly met with violent state repression um, in several cases, but one of them, um, Maria Ivancheva has documented it for Bulgaria, for African and Cuban students. So basically we have state socialist um, regimes in Eastern Europe that increasingly um, provided their own perspective on racialization, which also kind of spiraled up after the Iranian 
um, revolution um, and became also not only racialization of the other, but also especially an anti-Islam um, racial politics. So this is all, I think, leading up to what Steffi has described in the end as the re-Eurocentrization, uh, I think, of Eastern Europe after 1991. Um, but this was not just a cut, right? It was not just magically in 1990, 1991, that um, Eastern Europe rediscovers its belonging to Europe. But the racial politics, especially from the period leading up to that, were such that they were underscoring Occidentalism. I prefer the term Occidentalism to Eurocentrism because it really helps us to think of how Eastern Europe fits into that. It promoted an understanding of Europeanness as white and Christian to the detriment of the global South other and especially to the detriment of the uh, Islamic or the Muslim other, other. So what I think to sum it up um, collapsed with the state socialist regimes is also the possibility of having a buffer, both economic and political, to what we have seen in the past 30 years as the spiraling of global inequalities. And in these global inequalities on the economic side, there's no political buffer anymore to provide even that illusion of an alternative, even that illusion of an alternative political horizon, so that both the East um, Eurocentricization of Eastern Europe could take place unabashed, as well as the economic polarization to the between the one percent and the ninety nine percent was both more visible and more rapid. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Manuela. That's really interesting idea which leads us to today's problems that what collapse is the possibility of having a buffer preventing uh, polarization uh, of uh, the world. Perhaps uh, I will give uh, very shortly the possibility uh, to Steffi and to Artemi to react and then we will open the floor for questions uh, in the chat. Steffi, perhaps you want, uh, you, you want to, to start? Um, yes, I would love to, although I have to digest um, the, the different uh, trains of thoughts. Uh, thanks a lot for, for these comments. Um, I think the, the last point you made, Manuela, um, is, is quite interesting um, because it really nicely describes also this paradoxical situation before 1990. Uh, so I think what we really, really need to go beyond is you know, using those boxes on where to put people, where to put projects and where to put countries, you know, as, you know, uh, storing them away, but, um, but you know, deal with these ambivalences of uh, before and after 1990. Um, uh, when you kind of just what you describe as this um, the the function of the state socialist um, world as a buffer um, for depolarization of the world economy, I find this a quite interesting observation. Although I'm, I have to admit, I always struggle with world system theory um, um, as a global historian, but uh, it makes a lot of sense, um, and one could push this a little bit further because uh, so if the buffer disappears, uh, that would so if, if that's your argument, that would explain the rising polar repolarization of the world, not only of the world economy. And I would add to that, uh, what disappeared at the same time is an, an alternative language with which to articulate those polarizations. Um, and that might contribute to an understanding of the rise of, you know, uh, xenophobic populism um, in, in certain ways, right? So the, the search for, um, for a new language <clears throat> to describe the rising tensions. Um, so I think that's that's an interesting way of connecting the two uh, the two periods. Um, also, what um, the what Artemi described um, again this this ambivalent role of the Soviet Union as a mediator, but also as um, not the Soviet Union. Obviously, it's not an actor that has breakfast, but um, elites in the Soviet Union on the one hand um, that 
try to sell Soviet internationalism as the glue um, and as uh, the, the instruments with which to, to mobilize and how it demystified um, rapidly towards the 1980s. Uh, and one might add, it's, it runs parallel to a demystification and a devalorization of pan-Africanism, uh, of African socialism. So it's a parallel um, rupture and uh, frustration with a number of projects. I, I think it's less a causal relationship, but, but more also of a coincidence uh, of parallel um, uh, of a parallel fragility of projects in different parts of the world, which then contributes to this language that also disappears. Um, and that's why I would really be interested. I mean, when I teach uh, on the global Cold War or on Soviet African connections to students in, the, in their 20s, um, the seminars are full. Uh, not because they're so much fascinated uh, about the Soviet Union, but it's more, it seems to me that there's um, a desire to understand those alternative languages and those alternative um, projects, however they might have failed. Um, and how that this is then translated into the BLM movement or the uh, Fridays for Future movement, I find very interesting how languages of solidarity again become used. Uh, in a very innocent way. Um, for scholars of the Soviet Union, it's, it's always interesting to see how they are used, but I think it's, it's really relevant to see how this um, also language and symbolism also retains a certain power. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, Steffi Artemi, please. Yeah, I, I think I also need uh, some time to digest all of this. Um, but I, one thing I would say is perhaps not so much from my world systems theory perspective, but, but in a way, Echoing it, um, you know, the Soviet Union is a buffer, I think, in the sense that it's not really offering an alternative to capitalist modernity, right? What it's offering is maybe a different path to kind of getting to a similar kind of thing. And, and one of the ways of understanding the, the declining um, kind of faith in the Soviet project is that um, it seems to just show a less efficient way to get to a shoddier version of the same thing um and and this to me is is perhaps you know one of the ways of understanding the the kind of um the decline of of the soviet union as as a whatever you want to call it as another pole as a buffer or something else um in the 1980s but i don't think that's exactly what uh wallerstein meant um although maybe there's a way that those two understandings could be made to look at each other. I mean, coming back to the examples I was using, you know, it's very interesting that among um, the Central Asians were criticizing the Soviet Union, right? Their argument was instead of saying how much better we were, you know, than the African countries, you should have been comparing us to South Korea and Taiwan, right? So that, that was their understanding, right? It's really a failure of development rather than a failure of, you know, socialism or, or something else. Okay, Manuela, do, do you want yeah. Just seamlessly reacting to that. Um, basically, a faith in development and a hope for development is a buying into the capitalist project, um, as is the hope for efficiency. So basically, at the uh, discursive level, we have that throughout the um, Cold War period with modernization theory from the US and mode of production theory from the Soviet Union as basically competing, but not competing because the principle was the same thing. And even looking at um, Latin American um, dependency theory, the idea that actually you do need to industrialize and um, the industrialization is the model, uh, only that then you have to only trade among um, kind of um, peripheral countries in order to um, stave off dependency from the core would also buy into the idea that there is a linear development and that it has to do with efficient development. And so in a way, it is exactly what um, Wallace would have meant to say, uh, as when we understand that this is the model that we need to abandon in order to actually have global socialism rather than state socialism regimes, um, that's when a system change will happen. Because as long as the retreat into socialism is only at um, the state level, it is a, an enclave in a capitalist world system, but it doesn't leave it. So yeah, uh, and I completely agree with, with Sefi, uh, what disappeared is also the language, uh, even though the language might have been misleading. Right, but there, an idea that there is such a retreat or such a political uh, weaving of possibilities in another language 
than um, the one of um, capitalist modernity that it was very much the case. That's also why even the uh, discourse of the end of history becomes possible because that's um, history has ended. But and then the critique to that approach is also um, by um, people like um, Huntington, right? About the, it, well, it's not the end of history, it's the clash of civilizations that now comes because we don't have ideologies. And so the idea that you don't have an ideology needs a language or needs a language to disappear <laughs> for you to be able to argue that there's no ideology left to, to contend. It's only liberalism. Thank you, thank you very much. And now I have two questions in uh, the chat. One is from Leila Hirashi. <laughs> really, excuse me, I'm uh, very badly pronouncing your name. I'm really fascinated by this webinar. I do have to leave. Oh, she has to leave. That's no question at all. Um, and uh, from Gwendolyn, uh, thanks for the interesting inputs. Uh, and uh, a question primarily to Manuela, possibly to all. Can you provide a sense of how prominent references to the Soviet era and its constellations are in the global south today? Who discusses this primarily and how does it resonate? Manuela, please. I think that is a question to all of us. And also that is a um, kind of a keynote wide question, first of all, because it's hard to um, pinpoint the groups who would address that and where in the global south this is happening. And that is very different. Um, there is, of course, a lot of um, uh, memory and the legacy of um, those interactions that were mentioned in um, several points here. And um, Steffi also showed the, the book by Wukash Sanek um, on um, architecture, that this kind of concrete engagement that still has a material legacy um, is very much still present and very much discussed, but by very different groups again. And also in order to nuance it, and I, I know I'm not actually answering, but I'm uh, providing more questions to that question, um, the references are not necessarily to the Soviet era. They are references to socialism as a project. They are um, references to Marxism. Um, and if you would restrict that to the Soviet era, especially because that's um, what interests you um, particularly, I wouldn't even know that there are very concrete references um, prominent references in the global south to precisely the Soviet era as a project. I'm, I'm sure there are, but I'm not aware of a collective, massive, prominent one. But uh, please, um, the others can um, bring it in if I'm mistaken here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Steffi? I mean, on that one, again, that would be a great other keynote, <laughs> I have to admit. Um, I think one could on the one hand say nobody is discussing it and everybody is discussing it um, at the same time. So nobody in the sense of um, the Soviet and the Soviet model has disappeared and the younger generation, I think, is absolutely not aware um, in at least in the countries I'm working in. Um, it's, it's extremely difficult to talk about um, this with generations born after the end of the Cold War. Um, my most beloved anecdote is when I teach an artist there's a Soviet star on campus. So we look through the window of the seminar room, we look towards this uh, Soviet star. And at the end of the course in the global Cold War, the students come to me and say, now I understand why there is a Soviet star and that it is a Soviet star. You know, uh, I, you know, I always thought some kind of nice decoration. So, and that's, it's not to kind of mock those students. It's simply to demonstrate how clear cut this kind of erasure of this memory has been. And this has not only to do with this, you know, capitalist triumphalism, but in Ethiopia in particular, it's a traumatic uh, 1990s period. Uh, and it's a traumatic in its own right, dealing with uh, a, a, a horrible past. Um, they are themselves interrogating. So it has both these kind of Marxist Leninist regimes in African um, societies had to go through their transformation why it has become actually impossible to really talk about Marxism um, any longer. On the one hand, on the other hand, is that the falling down of the, the Soviet model has forced 
engineers, experts to return to their countries and their careers were ruined, um, completely devaluated. So the Soviet has become more and more been equal to, you know, the failing elephant. And at the same time, the Russians are extremely prominent and they are prominent in a certain way, kind of certain tropes of um, they are the alternative to the West are revitalized. So this anti-Westernism of the Russians is an aspect of the Soviet model that is, um, at least in the in, in, uh, Southern Africa or in Ethiopia um, or Ghana, uh, where I speak with people, uh, where this comes in. Um, so this, I think that's an interesting um, kind of, um, yeah, parallel. Um, but I wanted also to react to, to uh, Manuela, this question of is, and also Atimi, is socialist development something completely else than capitalist development? That is actually a question I'm, I would love to debate uh, in another form. Um, I would actually um, complicate this, uh, this equation uh, because referring to also an argument you made, ideology is important here. And I think we cannot you know, really cut this out of the equation. Uh, so the framing of this project has definitely been different. And the question is, of course, um, how much did it make it different? But also um, the, uh, the drivers, the, the elites driving these development projects forward were very much different from Western elites sitting in you know, development agencies coming from bourgeois backgrounds. Uh, very often in the Soviet context, a uh, very different social um, um, uh, milieu that was engaging with it uh, and also with different kinds of experiences bringing to the development projects. And I think that makes makes it a completely different, but I think it's it's difficult to to really um, equate and I would love to um, to further investigate this these differences and nuances. There was also very different funding, right? Like the amount of funding that, funding that went into the capitalist model is uh, way not even existing today. I was I was wondering if uh, if religious radicalism is providing an alternative language uh, to yes to describe um, alternatives i don't, i don't know i'm uh, coming from to the discussion from the outside but uh, it's not only fridays for future but there are different uh, religious radicalisms uh, which uh, apparently provide a, a language which is attractive to uh, certain certain social strata and which is used to describe uh, alternatives uh, I, I don't know if you if you see it like this or uh, and it's, I think it's, it's, it has a very very powerful appeal yeah I mean I think that's I think it did but I think that's um, in terms of being an alternative to socialism that was more the case in the late 70s and in the 1980s than it is now um, certainly the Iranian revolution I mean, um, you know, the leaders of that revolution uh, presented themselves as being kind of alternative both to socialism uh, and to capitalism, seeing them both as kind of uh, failed projects. Um, and this was something that uh, Soviet scholars and Soviet leaders were also aware of and trying to wrestle with. Um, I think today, I, I don't know, I, I suspect much less so because simply there isn't, um, there isn't the need to find an alternative to socialism, right? Um, certainly not from the perspective of, of you know, most of the world. Um, but in the 70s and 80s, I think that was absolutely something that also helped to delegitimize, arguably, um, you know, state socialism, although I think ultimately it had a very minor effect. Okay, thank you very much. I have uh, no questions anymore in the chat. Uh, Thank you very much uh, for your for your input. That, that was really uh, for me. That was really interesting, and I would like to uh, take the possibility to announce the next roundtable discussion. Uh, 
which is, uh, to my uh, uh, view, very, very important uh, too, which uh, the German Historical uh, Institute organizes uh, also uh, within our collaborative series of events, 30 post-Soviet years. Uh, Gwendolyn already mentioned it. Uh, on April 22, we will discuss the multiple and in many ways difficult transitions of socialist property relations into market uh, economy. And as examples, we will take the experiences of Russia, Poland, Germany, and the Ukraine. And our speakers will be uh, Markus Böck from uh, Ruhr University in Bochum, Michael Rochlitz from the University of Bremen, Peter Wegenschimmel from the University of uh, Vienna and uh, Sergei Zhuravyov from the Russian Academy of Science. And uh, they will share their ex uh, expertise with us. I think that will be a very, very interesting event. And I think it's in German, it's a very uh, discussed topic at the moment because uh, even in popular cinema there uh, uh, you you find uh, you find comments on the failure of the toy hunt solution and something like this i think it will be very very interesting uh, our working language will be german with similar simultaneous translation uh, into russian and uh, on behalf of the of all co-organizers, I would like to thank Manuela, Steffi, and Artemi for their input and all participants of our today's event for their interest uh, and uh, Gwendolyn for the questions. I hope that you have uh, aroused your interest with our kickoff venue and that you will join us in the forthcoming events of our series 30 post-Soviet years. Goodbye and stay safe. And I uh, hope that we will see it, uh, each other uh, perhaps next year in the real world. That would be very, very nice. <laughs> Thank you to all of us and bye-bye. <laughs>